Niis tõmne on piks, kui nii heoneb siisi, ka teonud intik, no aku magna, nii naskum on. Än muu tavinand smantu, kõne naskum tõin. Alga on kui ennis tšenšna bek, kõne naskum tõin oa, ennuks. My friends, my relatives, I'm very happy to be here. I greet you all in a humble, respectful way. I acknowledge our kind, loving creator. Give thanks for this beautiful day. And to the organizers, Canada 2020, Susan, thank you for the invitation to be here, to share a few thoughts, a few words, to engage in a meaningful dialogue about something very important to all of us, building a brighter future for everybody in this great, great country called Canada, both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. And it always begins with a dialogue and a discussion and bringing people together. And education awareness leads to understanding, leads to action. Very important things to happen. And so again, I commend and applaud the organizers. I want to acknowledge as well, Prime Minister is here. You know, it's good to, we, this is our second meeting today, Prime Minister Martin, and uh, I don't want to say we have to keep meeting like this, but it's good to see you again. <laughs> and uh, the leadership in the room, Roger Augustine, Jody wilson Rabel, my colleagues on the executive are here. I always lift them up because really, we try to function as a team, you know, and that's really what it's all about. Uh, Chief Maureen Chapman is here, Chief Joe Muskokamon, Chief Clarence Louis, of course, and I hope when I start listing names, if I miss the chief, I am so sorry. <laughs> but I lift them all for being here. And uh, I wanted to begin and start off with uh, Chief Louis quoted chiefs before, former national chiefs. And I want to leave this one quote to start off with. And it resonates not only for, for us as First Nations people, but, but as industry leaders, as government leaders, federal government, provincial governments, but industry leaders in light of this so quote from case, which respects and recognizes Aboriginal rights and title. Here's the quote. Before you build anything, before you build that pipeline, before you build that mine, before you build that pulp and paper company, before you build anything, that any infrastructure, build a relationship. Build a relationship with First Nations people. And that's what it's all about, building a relationship. I want to as well say, you know, 2017 is not far away. We are a couple of years away from Canada's 105th anniversary. What change could come between now and 2017 for First Nations and our relationship with Canada to make that occasion one that First Nations can really truly celebrate? 150 years. What can we look towards? What can we embrace in 2017? We know that our relationship with Canada has been challenging and the path forward more difficult than it needs to be, but there's always hope and there's always opportunity for positive change. When things look rough, hope and determination allow us to find that overlooked opportunity, that new way of looking at a situation, and ways to connect with activists, visionaries, and leaders to make things happen for those most in need. As First Nations people come out of the shadows of the residential school experience, we look forward with anticipation to the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We know that we are at a historic turning point. As a national leader, I see a path to hope and well-being for First Nations children and youth, and I see a path to positive change in relationship with Canada. The positive change we're driving towards is closing the gap between First Nations and the rest of Canada on all the important indices of social and economic development. To win that change, First Nations are daily asserting our fundamental rights as peoples in our territories. We will use the resources we have, our people, our languages and cultures, our values, our hard work and our lands and our resources to get what we need to sustain ourselves and to prosper once again. To be part of that change, 
Federal and provincial governments also have work to do. My first point focuses on the gap in well-being between First Nations and the rest of Canada and what needs to be done about it. We do have some anomalies and bright spots in Canada. We have 634 First Nations in Canada, over 50 different nations in terms of languages. We're all at different levels. Some have strong governance. Some are able to move beyond the Indian Act. Some have strong economic base. I think Chief Clarence from Osoyos, we hold him up. Chief Darcy Bear from the Go to Whitecap, we hold him up. Terry Paul from Membertude, we hold them up. They're doing strong things in economic development, creating jobs, creating wealth. And as we move down that road towards self-determination and self-government, it is linked to economic sustainability and economic development, no question. Self-determination is linked to economic certainty, economic stability, economic development. So we lift up those communities that are doing good things. They are examples, they are role models. But out of the 634, there are some challenges. And challenges in terms, there's a gap that we need to close. The work that lies ahead for First Nations as the first order of government and our younger treaty partners, the federal government, provincial governments. It requires a common understanding of our treaty relationship. And one day we say we will move beyond the Indian Act, we will move beyond contribution agreements, and one day our hope and dream will be to see First Nations law also recognized in addition to common law and civil law. And we'll also have that hope and dream that we'll break down that misconception or the myth that this great country was just founded on only two founding nations, French and English. They're beautiful languages, English, en français, s'il vous plaît, mais oui, je parle français un petit peu. But as well, the different indigenous nations had a big hand to play. And so our relationship really is a peaceful coexistence and mutual respect. That fundamental relationship we have with the crown but sharing the land and resource wealth, mutually benefit from the great wealth in this country. It's what we're supposed to be all about. But we see a gap, and we need to close that gap. Our relationship is founded in the equality of peoples, not the domination of one people by another. That spirit is now reflected in international human rights law, which expresses the connection between human rights Development, land, resources, security, and equality between peoples. We need to renew the spirit of equitable sharing and caring for one another. That is the essence of the treaty relationship. A first order of business is to create the fiscal mechanisms that will implement the sacred commitments of treaty partners that undertook as peoples to share this land. The fiscal transfers between federal and provincial governments between regions and between First Nations and the Crown are part of the bond that holds us together in Canada, which binds us as peoples, sharing the benefits and resources of this land and respecting one another. At the moment, these systems do not result in the equity for First Nations, and it's far from it. Unlike the fiscal base for services provided to people living off reserve, First Nations governments must manage many core services from health to infrastructure, and to education and child welfare through discretionary program funding that has no legal protections. Since 1996, Finance Canada has maintained an arbitrary 2% cap on spending increases for core services. This is one third of the legislated 6% increase that most Canadians will enjoy through the Canada Health Transfer, for example. Since 2006, provincial governments have on average increase their investments in their citizens by 4 to 10 percent annually. The significant gap in development outcomes for First Nations relative to Canada overall is therefore not surprising. The First Nations chapter in the alternative federal budget, which we've put forward a lot of times, captures the problem well. And the quote from that budget that we put forward is this. Current transfers to First Nation governments are, con are conditional, they're inflexible, inadequate, unpredictable, and arbitrary. We're caught in a system that has First Nations administering our own poverty. 
And when our people flee this entrenched fiscal discrimination to live in urban centers, the results of decades of fiscal and economic oppression are visible for all to see, and the responsibility of the federal government is downloaded to provincial governments. So federal offloading is an issue. The stats reveal the results of, dec of decades of fiscal inequity. One in four children in First Nation communities live in poverty. Got to apologize, Chief Louis. I just got to tell the facts. I said, don't mention poverty. But it's true. That's an issue for all of us. It's almost double the national average. First Nations children on average receive 22% less funding for child welfare services than other Canadian children. The suicide rates amongst First Nations youth are five to seven times higher than other young non-Aboriginal Canadians. In the face of this reality, the 2015 federal budget is clearly another costly and missed opportunity to develop a comprehensive approach to closing the gap between First Nations and other communities in Canada. In 2011, the Auditor General expressed profound disappointment, disappointment that a disproportionate number of First Nations people still lack the most basic services that other Canadians take for granted. The Auditor General went on to note the negative impacts of current unstable funding arrangement in these words. The use of contribution agreements to fund core government services and ongoing program obligations such as health care or education leads to poor stability from year to year for planning and program delivery, creates problems in timing of release of funds and its continuity, it in inhibits accountability to First Nation citizens and leads to onerous reporting. It's from the Auditor General. The contribution agreements are a problem. They're an issue. There are two basic problems. First, the status quo of chronic conscious underfunding regardless of need or equity. And second, First Nations governments are funded like NGOs rather than governments that are part of the constitutional fabric of this country. We should be as much a part of intergovernmental transfers as provincial and territorial governments. <coughs> Moving towards, again, not a third order of government, but recognition as a first order of government. The result is a lack of certainty for planning and ongoing social crises fueled by chronic underfunding. Inadequate, inappropriate funding arrangements have created systemic inequalities. The development gaps between Canada and First Nations will continue so long as the current fiscal arrangements continue. This is the essence of the equality rights case made before the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal by the Assembly of First Nations and the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. And a decision from the tribunal is expected any day. Childcare, the most vulnerable segment of our society, children, inequitable services, on reserve versus off reserve. That decision is going to be kind of a catalyst for change. Watch for that one. Child welfare services is just one example of how progress on social and economic development for First Nations is blocked by the lack of fiscal capacity to allow proper long-term planning and implementation of those plans. Put at its simplest, the 2% cap represents a lot on First Nations poverty. The international community is taking note of Canada's structural inequalities in its relations and treatment of First Nations. Respected human rights bodies are drawing the connection between gross socioeconomic disparities on the one hand and grave human rights violations on the other. We saw this in March of this year, when the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women concluded that Canada is committing grave human rights violations in failing to address the systemic discrimination that maintains entrenched poverty. And these human rights failures are a key factor fueling the ongoing tragedy of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights came to similar conclusions a few months prior. For those of you in the audience and across Canada who cannot relate to the fact that the rule of law absolutely requires the implementation of rights in ways that closes the gap, then I urge you all to consider the business case. There is a high cost to that poverty that exists, and that's not good for anybody in Canada. Maintaining that poverty is a situation where cheap is expensive over the long term. If we close the education and employment gap between First Nations and other Canadians, First Nations workers 
would add $400 billion to Canada's GDP by 2026. And Canada will save $115 billion in government expenditures. It's almost like invest now. Invest now. Invest in human capital. The fastest growing segment of Canada's population are young First Nations men and women. It's a growing pool. Invest in human capital, you'll have huge returns on investment. So what must we collectively do? Establishing an equitable relationship of sharing requires the federal government and First Nations to work on fiscal arrangements that will ensure all First Nations communities have basic government services on par with other communities in Canada. It's a fundamental human right and obligation in a country as rich as Canada. Good governance requires the delivery of essential government services such as infrastructure, education, health services, potable water, child welfare services, fire and policing services to ensure healthy and safe communities. First Nations communities do not have access to anything near the level and quality of government services that other Canadians enjoy. Many Canadians may not realize that the federal government has the same responsibilities for the delivery of essential services to our communities that provincial governments have for theirs. Unfortunately, there is no overall strategy. Our plan to work with First Nations to close the gap in living conditions and well-being, and we saw this again in Budget 2015. It was a status quo budget. It's not going to do anything to close the gap that exists. In recent years, the United Nations Human Development Index has ranked Canada as high as sixth or eighth in the world for living standards. While First Nations would fall to a rank in the neighborhood of 68 or lower. Six or eight, 63rd or even lower. It's the gap I keep talking about. It's the gap we need to close. And this gap represents everything we always talk about. The overcrowded housing conditions, the high youth suicides, the you know, missing or indigenous women and girls, the, 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 the funding cap on reserve, 6,500 on reserve tuition versus 10,500 in the provincial school system versus 20,000 in the French school system. It's a gap. That has to be addressed. The government's own community wellness index reveals that the comparative position of First Nations to the rest of Canada has barely changed in over 30 years. 30 years. Even in spite of the billions of dollars that people will say are spent on Indigenous peoples. What has changed? Two decades of underfunding has created living standards that remain well below the average that Canadians enjoy. And it is First Nations children who pay the highest price of this fiscal oppression from the day they are born, and that must stop. A new fiscal arrangement must acknowledge that the current starting point for most of our community is way behind other Canadians in terms of well-being and general living standards. A new fiscal arrangement must include significant catch-up investments with escalators that have a relationship to the realities of population growth, geography, and other relevant factors. The cost of doing business in the north is different than in the south. The cost of a school in the north is different than in the south. The cost of food in the north is different than in the south. Those all have to be considered. We all must end the punitive and discriminatory underfunding of First Nations communities. That's the key theme on that point. My second point is that renewing the treaty relationship in a broad sense means advancing progress on resource benefit agreements and on revenue sharing arrangements between the Crown and First Nations in each and Aboriginal title territory. The words we use are honor of the Crown and duty consult and accommodate. And because of the UN Declaration, free prior informed consent. And no, there is no veto utilized. So Canada can't go around the world saying there's a veto, there's a veto, there's a veto. In Silcoton, the word veto is not used. In the UN Declaration, veto is not used. But consultation, but recognition of Aboriginal rights and title, it's recognized. So follow the own, your own Supreme Court decisions. That's all we're asking for in that piece. Get comfortable with this new idea of revenue sharing. Get comfortable with the idea of including First Nations people every step of the way from start to finish in any project. Build the relationship first. Build the connection to the people. 
The first constitutional documents are the treaties that began before Canada was created and which remain sacred commitments to share as equals. We always talk about the relationship with the Crown, but there is a higher relationship we talk about. It's the relationship with the Creator. So when we talk about our treaties, it's a covenant. It's almost like a tripod. The Creator, and then indigenous people on one side, and then we're shaking hands with a non-indigenous person. You ever see a treaty medallion? It symbolizes that. As long as the sun shines, the rivers flow and the grass grows. The hatchet is buried. Peaceful coexistence and mutual respect. But that sanctity of contract, that sanctity of agreement, we always say is there's a higher bond, there's a higher connection. To establish a country that includes First Nations as equal partners will require fiscal arrangements with provincial and territorial governments that reflect the spirit and intent of the treaty relationship. Whether expressed in the older treaties or in the newer agreements on land and self-government. Adhering to the spirit and intent of treaty means that Canada cannot unilaterally renege on its commitment in modern land claims and self-government agreements. Lately, it has been doing so in the most blatant way by imposing legislation that contravenes constitutionally protected rights to engage in joint decision-making through jointly designed and agreed-to mechanisms. In the case of the older treaties, <coughs> resolving issues of treaty interpretation will require some common sense reordering of crown attitudes, a recognition that the extinguishment clauses, which are written in English and typically sent out after the verbal discussions of the treaty were made, are a fraud. The very notion of extinguishment is a violation of our fundamental human rights as peoples. And let me clarify, there was no extinguishment of our land rights and our resource rights. No one would say, here, take my land and give me next to nothing to live on. I don't believe Chief Little Blackbird agreed to that. relinquish. I don't understand these words. Because the treaties were all dialogued in indigenous languages. We're all dialogued in that oral history and those teachings. International human rights laws recognizing recognizes the fundamental rights of all indigenous peoples to sustain ourselves and to use our resources to prosper in our own lands. Our right to govern ourselves as peoples and to benefit from the resources in our lands is a fundamental human right and it cannot be extinguished. But the principle, peaceful coexistence and mutual respect. People talk about the Tuor Wampum Treaty. We have many kinds of treaties in Canada. From the Tuor Wampum, the Pre-Confederation Treaties, the Number Treaties, the Douglas Treaties, the Modern Day Treaties but it's all about peace, respect for our jurisdiction and our sovereignty on one side and our laws. And it's equally important as this one over here. Many of you have probably noted the mounting number of victories by First Nations in the courts, huge Supreme Court victories. These are all the more impressive because we've accomplished this in a system our, our governments don't even control. I don't get to appoint the Supreme Court judges. Maybe one day we'll see a First Nations judge, they're adding a little color. <laughs> Diversity, it's all good. In that system, we know we don't control it. But that says the victories we, we won, it says a lot about us that is good, and it also says a lot about Canada that is good. So there's much, there has been much discussion, but also fear in response to our victories, like the Haida Nation victory, like the Chilcotin victory. And I'm gonna speak about that fear today. Because we all wanna create economic certainty. Economic certainty. Provinces want that, industry wants that, First Nations want that as well. There is a recalibration of power that's taking place a shift in power relations that is seeing First Nations restored to a place of equality as peoples with both pride and sovereignty. Change is nothing to be afraid of. It's an opportunity. 
It's an opportunity to take the hand we've extended in peace for generations and join us in rebuilding our communities. At the international level, there is guidance about what it means to work in peace with indigenous peoples as equals, rather than as threats or as peoples to be dominated. The United Nations confirmed that under international human rights law, First Nations as indigenous peoples hold a right to self-determination that includes development rights in our traditional territories. Article 32, 32 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples says in part, Indigenous peoples have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands or territories and other resources. Our inherent rights as peoples have been confirmed by the UN, not created or granted, but rather recognized as existing human rights that are collective, pre-existing and non-extinguishable. What does all that mean? The legal landscape tells us that Canada cannot have the development it seeks without us. You've heard talk about the $650 billion in resource projects. Back to the quote, develop a relationship with First Nations people. And we want to have access, not only to the employment opportunities, not only to that Sunya or Samba in Dene, Dene Sanflele Nezonde, that Samba, that money, the jobs and the wealth creation, yes. But the added respect for the land and the water, long term sustainable economic development strategies. So that's why we need to be involved. That's why that relationship is so fundamental and so key to the development of anything in Canada, is build a relationship. It's also clear that the Crown efforts to design policies and machinery of government to manage its consultation and consent obligations are insufficient. Governments are still trying to align themselves with the requirements of the 11-year-old decision in Haida. Policy and operational practices continue to be a good decade or more behind the jurisprudence because the Crown continues to try to manage us as clients rather than negotiate with us as peoples. It's got to change. For the benefit of all Canadians, federal and provincial governments will have to recognize the reality of 2015, that there is shared sovereignty in this land, shared between First Nations and federal and provincial governments, shared sovereignty, shared resource benefits, shared resource revenues. We are not a third order of government or a municipal form of government. We are the first sovereign peoples of this land and continue to be the first holders of this land. Shared sovereignty means we will no longer tolerate being treated as claimants in our own lands. What we hold is what the Creator gave us. We do not hold grievances. We hold this land. The 634 communities in the more than 50 nations encompassed by the AFN have seen the worst and are ready and primed to roll back the tired old ways of thinking. We are resuming control. We are reasserting jurisdiction over our lands and resources. I will say occupy the field. And this is to the First Nation governments. Create your own laws. Occupy the field. If you don't want federal law to apply, you don't want provincial law to apply, create your own matrimonial real property act. Create your own child and family services act. Occupy the field and create your own laws. We're ready for meaningful consultation with the Crown on major policies and legislation. The obligation of the Crown to consult with First Nations on major pieces of legislation affecting our rights as peoples was recently confirmed by the Miccosukee Cree First Nation through Coterie decision. Our environmental values and our notions of how to balance development, environmental protection and sustainability are part of this country and it's time we were listened to. We are ready to do business with the business sector and we are ready to work with federal and provincial governments at all ministerial level tables. All energy tables, economic development tables and education tables. Canada needs to get this right. First Nations need to get this right. First Nations are no longer willing to sit on the side of the road watching the rocks, the minerals, forests and other natural resources taken from our territories while our communities struggle. Ensuring all opportunities and benefits of resource development are fully shared 
with First Nations as a theme whose time has come. Everybody started to talk about revenue sharing. Governments are starting to talk about this revenue sharing that's needed to create economic certainty. It's happening in the Northwest Territories. 25% of the royalties in NWT go back to Indigenous peoples. In Quebec, Premier Carrard has set up two tables, one on resource revenue sharing, one on duty consultant accommodate. Every Premier I talk to is somewhat kind of open-minded, some we've got to work a little bit more, but they're coming around. And when economies are booming, I always say this, the boom will be even louder when First Nations people are involved. It'll be huge. It'll be a loud boom, economic boom. And it'll really have impact on GDP. Canada has suffered an economic depression a few times in its history. Measures were taken to help alleviate the pressures of those times. Most recently, we saw programs to promote economic stimulus. First Nations have been in a long-term economic depression that has left most of our communities in a state of poverty. The footprint that is left in our communities is unmistakable. The gap is felt by our very young to our elderly. Canada, provinces, territories, and First Nations need to come together to build a more inclusive Canada and a strong and honorable future for this country. To be successful, we need to work together on systems, on policy, and new agreements to consider how revenues are shared and how resources are developed in a meaningful, sustainable way. There is also important work to do to build capacity and educate our young people. That brings me to my third point, <coughs> education. What must First Nations do to advance our development agendas at the national level and each treaty and tidal territory? We must instill hope in our children and youth that, bring, that things can and will change that we can change, that we can make change happen through collective and individual action and by being who we are. If we've come through civilize the Indians, assimilate the Indians, terminate the Indians, and now it's integrate the Indian people. Because of the things we've come through, we will not be integrated as indigenous peoples dragging their heads down and not feeling good about who you are. We're gonna be integrated because we have the technical vocational skills and training, we have the university training, and we're getting those jobs not because we have beautiful brown skin, it's because we have the skills to offer and make a contribution to that company. And we're gonna be proud of who we are, proud of our languages and our culture. Because at one time it was beaten out of us that your language is no good, your seminaries are no good, you're no good as a person through the residential schools, and so it was just done away. So our young men and women need to get that hope back, need to get that pride back. And when we do integrate, it won't be dragging our heads and feeling bad about who we are. It'll be proud, proud First Nations people, making a huge contribution to the economy and to this country. That education system is key. We, we are the entrepreneurs, the teachers, the environmental and resource managers who care for the land, the elders and spiritual advisors, the activists, the hunters, the medicine people. The resurgent of First Nations culture and political activism is as high as, as, as has ever have been since we first experienced Keguayama colonialism. Sometimes with Cree speaker, you have problems with S's. A critical part of this change is being brought about through the education of our children and our youth by First Nations teachers. Our rights, both Aboriginal and treaty rights and inherent rights, and our right to self-determination include the right to develop, manage, and maintain our own education systems. First Nations control of First Nations education remains the foundational principle supporting First Nations, and it is the litmus test by which we assess any education proposal. We say we walk in both worlds. We need two systems of education. K-12, university, technical vocational skills, strong on math and science, everything else over here, equally as important on this other hand. Your languages, your customs, your ceremonies, your traditions, who you are as an indigenous person. You need both systems to walk in balance. The elders say it's like a team of horses. You've got to pull, pull together, walk in balance. Since the 2% cap on education funding was first implemented in 1996, it has created an historical funding shortfall totaling more than $3 billion for First Nations across Canada. 
This inequity is holding us back and must be addressed by a new fiscal framework accompanied by standards and accountability, but not with management or oversight by the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. They don't have any ec education experts over there. Prime Minister always points that out. There's no educational experts in the department, but they put this piece of legislation in place. The fact that a political agreement to address education reform fell apart does not mean that Canada and First Nations should stop trying. So Bill C-33 kind of fell off the rails. Doesn't mean we stop trying. Come back to the table. Come back and establish a proper respectful process. Not as stakeholders, our claimants, but as governments and as peoples. That's the process we need to keep pushing for. We must engage and there must be a process that recognizes and supports regional and local diversity and that respects our jurisdiction, our treaty rights and our inherent rights as Indigenous peoples. Over the past six months, the National Indian Education Council and the AFM Chiefs Committee on Education has developed a First Nations Education Work Plan. In December 2014, the Chiefs in Assembly approved for further discussion development a framework for a federal act for funding for First Nations education and for advocacy on First Nations education issues. The draft framework is restricted to defining what the federal responsibilities are in relation to funding First Nations education. We understand the need for education reform and that standards and accountability mechanisms are tied to funding. And First Nations are doing this work. What First Nations won't accept is for crucial elements to be dictated by a federal department with no First Nations education expertise. Where adequate resources have been provided to First Nations, great work has been done in places like Kettle and Stony Point. We thank, again, Prime Minister Martin for that assistance there, the support there at Kettle and Stony Point regarding literacy. Their numbers went from down here, they're off the charts. Provincial standard, they're way above, literacy is way above the charts. And that's an example of what can happen when adequate human and financial resources are put in there, the supports are put in there. The literacy rates for the First Nations children in that community are way up high, within four years. As well as on the East Coast, the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia, they've had a First Nations control of their system for many years, doing really good things. And they're proven, the students are, have proven that if they are given equal resourcing and the quality of education provided to other students in Canada, they can achieve at the same or even exceed provincial rates. And while we know success isn't only about money, funding is absolutely crucial for First Nations schools to offer a quality education that values our cultures and languages. One only needs to look at the funding level for provincial French minority language schools which receive more on average than their English counterparts to see what appropriate funding levels are required when a language is under threat. Out of those 50 languages I talked about, 50 indigenous nation languages in Canada, from the Mi'kmaq, Pasquamari, Maliseet, to the Cree, the Ojibwe, to Anishinaabek, to the Blackfoot, to the Squam, all, there's over 50 languages. Three may survive. Three. That's a huge travesty in this country. So we need to really focus on a First Nations language strategy. Rejuvenation, reinvestment, to build it up. And it's really fundamental, I'm gonna just a few, few more points, I'm done. Why that is so key, indigenous language, it's tied into the right to self-determination. You need your own land, your own laws, your own people, your identifying forms of government, and your own languages. Five elements that require, require in international law the right to self-determination to be in place. So if we lose Dakota, our Nakota, does that mean there are no more Nakota peoples, the Assiniboine peoples? If we no longer hear Mi'kmaq being spoken, does that mean there are no more Mi'kmaq people? So the importance of language is really key. It's tied into self-determination, but it's also tied into success in life and in school for young First Nations men and women. 
The vital role of First Nations culture and language in the curriculum is evident in the success stories in First Nations education, such as that of Akwasasne, the Mohawk language there, the Haudenosaunee people, you know, the Ongbohoi. It's powerful. It's powerful. When discussing education and the need for a broader understanding of First Nations issues, we need to work with provinces and territories to ensure the curriculum includes First Nations culture and history. I'd like to acknowledge those jurisdictions that have already embarked on this very important work. In Manitoba, First Nations have developed an education toolkit that's being aligned with, Manitoba, with the Manitoba curriculum. The rollout is planned for the fall. In Saskatchewan, treaties are taught in every school from kindergarten to grade 12. Kudos to Premier Wall. It's legislated. Every Premier I've met, I've said three things to them. Change your curriculum in three areas. Number one, teach about Aboriginal rights and treaty rights in the schools. Number two, teach about residential schools and the impacts in the schools. Number three, recognize Indigenous languages. Somehow in your curriculums. Those three requests. That's starting to happen. That's starting to happen. People need to see themselves in their curriculum. People need to see themselves because it's validation and acceptance. It's validation and acceptance of valuable contributions. Very important. As National Chief, one of my key priorities is to close the gap in well-being and living conditions that exist between First Nations and the majority of Canada. It is obvious that without significant investments in First Nations education and other critical supports such as housing, potable water, and viable effective child protection programs, closing the living standards and wellness gap will be elusive. Fiscal funding inequities are a cap on First Nations potential and therefore on Canada's potential. When defining economic development objectives on reserve, or off reserve, meeting the education needs of First Nations children and youth must be included in that discussion. Without educated citizens and an educated workforce, our communities will continue to struggle to realize their economic development objectives. The path to change to healthy, vibrant First Nations communities lies in holding up our First Nations youth. Instilling hope in their futures lies in rebuilding within our own communities. That's the responsibility of First Nations leadership. Governance. Finding ways to move beyond the Indian Act based on your own laws and languages and cultures. Rebuilding the relationship between First Nations and Canada, including fiscal relations, is a joint responsibility. A concept that we're going to start talking about at some point is assumed Crown sovereignty assumed crown jurisdiction and start dialoguing about this thing called the doctrine of discovery. It makes you go, hmm. Our young people are eager and waiting. Our elders and teachers are ready to lead. Our entrepreneurs and our land managers are ready to work. We reach out our hands to our treaty partner and say, let's get to work and build a stronger Canada for all of us. Exit. Thank you much for listening.